Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to LEAD, Leading Equity and Diversity. I'm Dr. Debbie Willis, pronouns she, her, hers, and I lead the DEI certificate program here at the University of Michigan's Rackham Graduate School. We started this series because scholars wanted to hear from real people their experiences leading equity, diversity, and social justice efforts. Thank you all for joining us today. Given all that's going on in the world right now, we appreciate your presence and your willingness to be here with us. Before we get started, please note that you can enable the live closed captioning by clicking the CC button on your screen. Though your audio and video are muted, we encourage you to engage in the conversation through the question and answer portal. We'd love to bring your voices into the conversation. If you see a question that interests you, please like or upvote that question, as we will ask questions with the broadest interest first. Before submitting your question, we ask that you consider how your words might impact others. We also ask that you are patient with us, as hundreds of you registered for today's webinar, and we received many questions at registration. We will not get to them all in an hour. However, we are committed to continue these conversations. So last year on May 29th, 2020, amid racial unrest and seeing the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color, we dedicated this lead webinar series to address racial equity for an entire year. And this webinar fulfills that year long commitment. We invited you all to join us each month for a conversation on anti-racism and racial equity. Each month, hundreds of you joined us for 12 months straight. So thank you for being with us along this journey. We also invited you to join us for your own one month commitment because we just talked about sustained commitment and not letting just the moment go. 600 of you opted in to get monthly emails and an opportunity to reflect on your commitment. So we applaud you for that. Today's conversation will address how racism is a public health crisis. And we have two phenomenal guests with us to lead this conversation, Dr. Enrique Neblet and Dr. Chiquita Collins. Let's start with brief introductions. Chiquita, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey as a leader and advocate in the space of equity, diversity, and inclusion? Well, thank you, Dr. Willis. And I want to say I pre appreciate the invitation to come join and speak on this timely topic. And so uh, where should I start? Um, so currently, I am the inaugural Vice Dean for Inclusion and Diversity at the Joe R. and Teresa Lozano Long School of Medicine here in San Antonio. I'm also the Associate Vice President for Inclusive Excellence in Health Equity at the UT Health uh, University. And I am an Associate Professor of Population Health Sciences. So my background is demography. And so um, native of Chicago, uh, come from a large family, Catholic family, um, matriculated in, uh, I would say, in terms of Catholic schools in Chicago. So I had a very good uh, educational foundation, went to Lane Tech, which I didn't know until later on in my adult years, that it is um, the only high school in the country that has produced the highest number of PhDs. And so um, from there, I matriculated to the University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, was torn between, I always had interest in medicine. So I majored in biology. And given that I was working full-time, as well as having a full-time course load, and a lot of first-generation students can uh, relate to this, uh, realized that college wasn't meant for me. Dropped out. Uh, and see, we don't share our, 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 our failures in terms of our success stories. And that only lasted for one semester. And so, like many, um, I decided on either psychology or sociology, and by the luck of a draw, pursued sociology. Faculty members saw potential in me and inspired me to encourage me to pursue graduate studies. I applied to three schools, only one application made it into the mailbox, and that was the University of Michigan, go blue. And so from there was awarded a merit scholarship. And I tell you, 
Michigan was a fantastic experience. Uh, we had the critical mass of faculty members who invested and were committed to our success. I uh, worked with David Williams, who is now at Harvard University. We pursued um, seminal pieces of, of research as it pertains to social determinants of health, decided to pursue the traditional academic route, was on faculty for many institutions. In fact, many people think I'm in the military in terms of the many moves I've made. Uh, <laughs> went back to my alma mater in terms of the University of Illinois, Chicago, taught at Georgia Tech, pursued a postdoc with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation as a health policy scholar, landed at UC Berkeley, got back on the market, secured a job at UT Texas, go Longhorns, and decided academia was not for me, pursued a job that was looking for a diversity officer, um, negotiated because Michigan te teaches us very well in terms of how to negotiate and so became the assistant dean of diversity and cultural competence at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, was promoted within six months to become the associate dean of cultural competency and diversity. And in five years, you know, opportunity knocked and I landed this job. And so um, that's a short, brief, uh, abbreviated uh, journey. And again, you know, I think it's important for people to share their journeys because sometimes people only see the outcome of our success and not the path in which we had pursued to get there. Thank you, Chiquita. Enrique. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for the invitation uh, to be a part of this presentation. And um, I'm in awe and just honored um, to be sharing the space today with Dr. Collins. So. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Um, I'm a professor here at the School of Public Health, uh, professor of health behavior and health education. Uh, this is my second year back at Michigan. Um, I'll get to that um, in a second. Um, I also serve as the associate director of the Detroit Community Academic Urban Research Center, or the Detroit URC, uh, as we call it. Um, and I'm also the associate faculty lead uh, of DEI for the School of Public Health. Uh, in terms of my background, um, I'm a second generation Black American. I grew up in East Orange, New Jersey, uh, which is a suburb of Newark, uh, New Jersey, um, to immigrant parents, as you can tell. Um, so my uh, mom's from Guyana, South America, uh, and my dad is Panamanian. Uh, and so um, that's a part of my uh, background and my lineage. Uh, I did my training here, uh, like Dr. Collins, uh, my graduate training at least, uh, in psychology, um, where I worked under the um, tutelage and wise mentorship of Robert Sellers. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Dr. Collins mentions uh, David Williams. David is one of my academic idols and also uh, was a member of my uh, dissertation committee. Um, so um, I work closely with David as well and am a big fan. Um, in terms of my di uh, diversity trajectory, uh, you know, um, it's hard to say when that exactly started. Uh, you know, formally, uh, I would say uh, once I became tenured in 2014, uh, I was at UNC for 11 years uh, in psychology and neuroscience. Um, and at that time, uh, right after I became tenured, they had a formal uh, faculty fellowship program. It was diversity and education research faculty fellowship program. Um, for faculty who were interested in being a part of leadership in diversity initiatives. Um, and so I did that. They assigned you to a couple of committees. I was a part of um, learning what goes into a university-wide survey climate. Um, I also led a, a learning committee on uh, faculty and student diversity uh, with some, um, some colleagues there at UNC. Um, and that kind of opened the door for me. Um, I served on Provost Committee of Inclusive Excellence and Diversity. Uh, and then went on in my own department um, to be appointed director of diversity initiatives, uh, where I led the uh, diversity committee in our department, uh, and also, you know, um, went on to serve on a number of diversity related uh, committees at the at the university. So um, that's a little bit of my background, uh, just you know, kind of starting off uh, in the the diversity space, but really looking forward to. I'm growing in that area. Um, I've learned so much even in the new role in the past year about um, how uh, diversity efforts and initiatives actually work, <laughs> quite different than how you think they work uh, once you actually get into it. Um, and so I'm really excited to be continuing to, to do that work. 
Um, I kind of left out, um, many people know that my um, area of research is in the area of racism and health, uh, primarily uh, with young Black Americans, um, although that has expanded uh, with time. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. So the another thing that the three of us have in common is that David Williams was on all of our dissertation committees. How cool is that? Okay. So the first question, we'll start, we'll, we'll start very broad in general. Why is racism a public health problem? Like, what does that mean to you? And Enrique, we can start with you. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I think there are a couple of different ways uh, to answer that question. Uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll start with the, the obvious way, um, and that it, it's a, a public health problem because it concerns uh, the uh, longevity, uh, the um, sort of life expectancy of people. And we know that there are disparities um, in population groups, um, that not everyone enjoys the same uh, time. Uh, on this planet, not everyone enjoys the same uh, quality of health. Uh, and uh, racism is a system that, um, you know, sort of shapes uh, how long you live, um, how ill you are, um, access to vaccines, so on and so forth. So um, obviously um, a, a problem in that regard. Um, you know, we have certainly uh, for a long time talked about discrepancies in terms of life expectancy, um, you know, 14 years in some places, right, between Blacks and whites. And uh, many of you probably saw the um, data that came out, I think, earlier this year or late last year about um, kind of the life expectancy shortening, uh, maybe uh, eight tenths of a year for whites um, in the first half of 2020 as a function of the pandemic, but three years um, for Black folks. So uh, racism is a, is a, a problem uh, for that reason. Um, I am trained in mental health, so it's a problem to me because it not only influences uh, physical health, but um, psychological distress. And that is, you know, sort of uh, turns into, uh, you know, problems uh, in terms of physical illness. Um, even though, uh, you know, the uh, epidemiology, you know, rates are similar for mental health, we know that um, Blacks and other groups have more severe um, psychological distress. Um, and issues of mental health uh, access are a problem. So, so these are some reasons. Uh, you know, I think um, in terms of another way that I am, would think about this question is that um, racism is a problem because we don't want to talk about it all the time. Uh, a lot of um, us are selective. Um, you know, it's really funny in these conversations. Um, the things that we're saying now, um, are things that people have been saying for a long time. David was saying them a long time ago, people before David were saying them. And look what it took, right, for uh, us to start having a national conversation about it again. It took someone being murdered. Um, it took a, a global pandemic. Um, and so I think that's a, a, a problem. The last thing I'll say in terms of why this is a problem is that um, it's a very personal one uh, for me. Um, just seeing the number of people who have died prematurely um, in my life um, and, uh, you know, even just in the past year, losing an aunt to COVID, having a brother who was hospitalized uh -huh. uh, for COVID. Um, this is a problem um, where um, people are dying and um, we need to take stock and figure out how to finally make some progress in this area. Yeah. Shakita? Well, I would like to add, um, Enrique made a very eloquent uh, response to that question. You know, we haven't talked about it. We've been walking on eggshells and we look at even the literature and the research on social determinants of health. We've been doing it for over 50 years, although we didn't have that terminology. We have been reporting the discrepancies or disparities that are so pervasive, primarily among the BIPOC community, Blacks, Indigenous, and people of color. And so I would say that we are now in this racial reckoning to really articulate. And in academic, academic medicine, we are now understanding the value and the challenges that exist in terms of addressing it as we teach our next generation of physicians and clinicians and scientists. And so although when we look at racism, many people only think about it for, from the perspective of interpersonal relationships, 
but racism is, is systemic to various social structures, right? So it's not only medicine, it's not only education, it's um, uh, real estate, uh, employment. And so a uh, paper that we did many years ago really uh, shed light on understanding the fundamental root of racism really is pertained to racial um, segregation, residential segregation, right? That's one of many. But um, if you look at it, even though it has been uh, unconstitutional back in 1968, right? We still live in a segregated country, right? You talk about South Africa in terms of apartheid, but I tell you, you know, economists have shared that if we reach a certain tipping point in terms of um, communities becoming integrated, it only reaches like 4%. And we see this phenomenal in terms of people uh, uh, leaving communities because they believe in these negative stereotypes that poverty values are going to plummet. Uh, blacks and other uh, minority groups are going to bring in a criminal element and all these negative types of you know, assumptions that are made. And so we have to continually, uh, uh, I would say, um, uh, challenge those uh, stereotypes. And I know we're going to talk about solutions. It's not just reporting the problems, but I am pleased, you know, uh, in terms of we're not at a point where we are having these, um, I would say, courageous conversations because it takes that in order for us to learn from each other and to move beyond just, you know, uh, leaning on scholars who've been doing it for many years. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So the next question talks a little bit about um, some of the solutions, perhaps. But the question is, how does increasing the pipeline of BIPOC of the BIPOC population into public health and the medical fields address racism in public health? And we'll start with you, Chiquita. Okay. Is my mic on? Mm-hmm. All right. So, you know, although um, we've made some inroads, primarily as pertains to women, uh, we've reached gender parity in terms of our medical schools, primarily across the country. We still have work to do in terms of diversifying our um, a student population uh, in terms of medical students. In fact, you may have heard um, uh, Black men uh, tend to um, be our biggest challenges. Um, uh, reports have indicated, for example, that um, the number of Black matriculants in medical school in terms of Black men have remained stagnant for almost 40 years, you know, 1978, right? And so there is um, a now, I think uh, we have pivoted in terms of understanding that we have to really rev up our energies in addressing um, this population. And so I would say, you know, and this will require even more in-depth conversation. It's not to the point where we're reaching um, and trying to recruit them when they are um, completing college, we have to really start at younger ages. When we talk about the pipeline, there are many programs that exist for high school students, um, post -bac baccalaureate um, programs that exist, and they have been successful. However, scholarship has shown that we have to reach at the age of, or at the grade of uh, uh, third grade, when students are, you know, um, deciding on in terms of careers and, and really introducing them to, um, to STEM, science, technology, and, and math courses. That's the instrumental point by which we really have to target our energies and to invest in them longitudinally, not just at one point time period. We have to invest, we have to follow them, we have to provide opportunity. So I would say greater investment is needed in recruitment, mentoring and retaining medical students and across the medical education as well, not just at that time point, but also when they advance and become residents, fellows, and then become practicing physicians, some of which will decide on uh, returning into academic medicine. And so we have to make sure that we do our due diligence at all those important stages or phases in their career so that we can see change. Otherwise, we're going to be right where we are today, 10 years from now. So true investment requires commitment, being intentional in our efforts, and really doing our due diligence at, at those um, pivotal um, stages and phases. Yeah, thank you. Enrique, would you like to add from the public health standpoint or outside of the medical field and psychology? Or Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll just um, comment that um, the pipeline obviously is critical. Um, I really enjoyed uh, reading about some of the work that Dr. Collins has done um, in this area, um, which have been groundbreaking, and, and she's really been a leader um, in this area. 
Uh, I guess more so than uh, answering the question, uh, you know, in terms of public health or psychology, I'll just make a comment. And that is that the progression that we are seeing in terms of uh, racism being a more prominent part of discussion in terms of models of social determinants of health, um, I think is a direct result of more um, students who are in the pipeline that we want to bring into public health and medicine um, coming into the field. Um, mm -hmm. I think that um, these conversations and the awareness um, is more likely to occur uh, when these folks that we're talking about, these very talented students, um, our leaders are the people who are the presidents of public health associations. Um, and so um, for me, another reason um, why this is really critical uh, in terms of addressing uh, racism as a public health uh, crisis is that the more folks that we can bring in who, you know, have lived experience uh, with uh, racism um, and who are in these types of um, not just getting through the door, but leadership uh, opportunities and who are sitting at the table to inform the conversations and discussion, I think um, that takes us a step closer to addressing uh, racism as a, as a crisis. Yeah, thanks so much. So just in speaking of health outcomes, Black people, and the, the question says Black people, but many people of color have much lower health outcomes across all health categories. What factors in society contribute to lower health outcomes for people of color? And what can we do to combat or reverse this? Very complex, very challenging, you know, back to the point of um, understanding the root causes. Sometimes we use this behavioral modeling as if it is the onus is on the person. They choose to engage in poor health um, behavior, you know, um, but we're not understanding the social context by which these behaviors occur, right? And so growing up in Chicago, I live in close proximity to the notorious Cabrini Green uh, housing project, right? And so we ascribe certain behaviors because we make assumptions about people, mm -hmm. right? And we don't necessarily look at the, um, the billboards that are advertising alcohol. We don't necessarily talk about the lack of grocery stores. We talk about food deserts or the neighborhood grocery store that sells, you know, um, poor vegetables and, and fruits, but, you know, more inclined to see, you know, junk food that has a high uh, incidence of, of, of calories and so forth. So, it, it, and it, even learning from, you know, those who are in marketing and advertising, you know, food placement in grocery stores makes a huge impact in terms of what people purchase, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the affordability of good quality foods is very limited in, in marginalized communities. And so we have to take all those things in consideration. We talk about the social determinants of health. You say I need to engage in physical activity where if I am in a situation which there are no sidewalks, there's no neighborhood parks and facilities for my children to engage in any type of activity, it makes it very difficult, right? So we we have to make sure that we take the social context into consideration. And so there's been a lot of debate and I would say um, to include all the various types of social services that will lead to a better health outcome. It's not just the onus on public health experts, it's not the onus only on health and medical phys uh, doctors and physicians, but we also have to engage the community, you know, those who invest in, in these uh, in, in, in areas. And so that's just a, a tip of, you know, understanding why people engage in certain behaviors. And we haven't even discussed in terms of the level of distrust and mistrust that certain communities have towards the health community. Mm -hmm. And we have a long history in terms of legacy. And in addition to current, um, uh, I would say, uh, realities by which people are hesitant to even engage in getting the COVID-19 vaccine because of our history. You know, so I'll, I'll leave it and have Enrique share in terms of his point of view as well. Yeah, um, I think uh, some of the factors that I've been thinking about um, that contribute to this problem. I mean, the, the list is, is, is so long <laughs> at this point, right? Uh, so uh, Dr. Collins really, I think, spoke to issues around uh, food security and, and built environments, which are critical um, social determinants of health. 
Um, as someone that uh, is interested in young people, we know that um, early traumatic uh, childhood experiences are important to consider, um, that um, these things have been linked with, um, you know, increase in stress hormones um, and subsequent difficulties in terms of health outcomes uh, later in life. Um, we know that um, poor education is certainly a part of the conversation that kind of sets the stage for your income, um, you know, economic stability, um, how able you're going to be able to afford health, health insurance, um, access to quality health care, um, those kinds of things. Uh, you know, in addition to, uh, you know, when I think about food, there's also housing, uh, there's, the, you know, the social community, uh, there are lots of different factors. And, uh, you know, some newer ones that um, I've been thinking about, I just taught a course on um, population health determinants. Uh, we have to be talking about um, incarceration um, as a social determinant of health. Obviously, we have to be talking about uh, police violence um, is certainly relevant to uh, health outcomes. Um, even um, the, the digital divide and access to, um, you know, who has internet access um, has implications for um, who has uh, access to knowledge. Uh, and those things can shape um, health outcomes. So all of those things are important. Uh, I think uh, one of the things that was interesting to me uh, when the pandemic started and we saw these disparities, people were like, oh, you know, it's, it's poverty, it's economic uh, inequality. Um, and, you know, people always talk about social determinants of health as the, you know, the root of the root, the, you know, the fundamental causes. And in a lot of these conversations, people were not talking about racism. Uh, but going back to the first question, um, all of these things that Dr. Collins has mentioned and that I've also mentioned are, are shaped, are structured uh, by racism. And so I was puzzled uh, as to why we were having these conversations. I actually had people say, oh, it, it's not poverty. Can you, can you show me that? Um, you know, it's, it's, or it's not racism, you know, this is all about poverty. You know, we've heard this conversation over and over, but um, these are the, um, the kinds of things, um, you know, we can look at the long list. I'm a racism scholar, so I'm a little bit biased, but I think that racism is at the root of, you know, roll back poverty. How do we get to poverty? How do we get to these inequalities? How do we get to incarceration, uh, so on and so forth? Um, in terms of what we do, I mean, we could be here um, for a very long time um, in any of the, the, you know, sort of areas that I gave, um, there's um, policies that are, um, you know, people are talking about um, in order to address these sorts of issues. So, um, you know, we're even right now debating the, the George Floyd uh, Police Act, right? And uh, we've seen um, specific initiatives in terms of if we, if we want to just pick one of them around economic instability, you know, people have been talking about um, baby bonds, um, you know, the child tax credit that we saw earlier this year, um, and other sorts of things. These are all things, uh, you know, I, I think part of our conversation today is about anti-racism. For me, the broad answer to the question is that it's all about policies and programs and practices that are going to reduce the inequity. And so anything that does that to me is a way that we move forward uh, on this question. Yeah, thanks so much. I do want to read, I think you both have kind of addressed this question, this in um, our question and answer, but I'm going to read it and then you can decide whether we should um, spend any more time on it. But it says, you can easily understand how racism is a public health crisis among low income with limited access to public, uh, with limited access to education um, for minority groups. Yet, can we still easily say that racism is a public health issue among high income, highly educated minorities? The first thing that comes to mind is mental health. Are there any other impacts? Can we say that high education and good income is your shield toward any public health disparities, even if you come from a minority group and is constantly subject to discrimination? So I'll begin. Um, you may remember in terms of the seminal report that came out by the Institute of Medicine back in 2002, unequal treatment. Mm -hmm. And it Highlight, highlighted at least 500 studies to document even after st uh, statistically controlling for all those things, income, education, you would think that 
um, those disparities will disappear. But those who are coming from even, um, I would say, affluent um, uh, statuses still experience um, racism. And you asked earlier on in terms of, yes, we can, we can talk about the studies, but also in terms of our own personal experiences. Yeah. You know, as a child growing up in Chicago, my parents grew up in the deep south, and when they migrated to Chicago, they still knew certain tricks of the trade. I had to get dressed up to go to the mall because my parents felt that we will be treated differently if we wore you know, our everyday clothing. That doesn't prevent you. You've heard of stories of Oprah Winfrey trying to get into a um, upscale boutique in New York, right? And they didn't recognize who she was and you had to be buzzed in and they didn't buzz her in. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear countless stories, anecdotal stories, as well as stories that have been documented in research. And so that does not give us any type of access or privilege just because of our titles, just because where we live, just because of our income. We experience the same amount of racial discrimination because of who we are and how people perceive us. And so there is, you know, there is much work to be done and it doesn't, it should not fall on the onus of those who are of those ascribed identities. Mm -hmm. It really is gonna take a village. And I mean, in terms of a collective effort an investment, true commitment, and we need to hold institutions accountable, you know, because we've been dealing with this for many years. And, it, you know, for us to expect our students to, you know, we, we talk about uh, resilience, mm -hmm. you know, we have been resilient for many decades. Yeah. And so uh, it's a matter of, again, institutions taking accountability to eradicate um, those environments in which we have to uh, uh, are faced with so that we can be successful and thrive. And so I am very hopeful and optimistic that we're at this point and we're having these conversations that we haven't had in the past. And so um, I'll leave it as that, Enrique. Yeah, so I have um, two responses to the question. I agree uh, with uh, Chiquita, we know from re research that even when you take into account uh, socioeconomic status, um, you still see some of these disparities, right? Mm -hmm. And um, as she pointed out, there have been numerous examples, um, anecdotal and otherwise, uh, that um, suggest even if you're, you know, you're Serena Williams, uh, for example, that doesn't protect you. Uh, but um, I think I would throw lob a question back to the person who posed this question. And I would say, let's look at the life expectancy of college educated Blacks, for example. Even with a college educated degree, people have discussed the fact that those folks still, I, I get the exact numbers mixed up, um, but are not living as long as um, whites who have uh, lesser uh, education, or I'm sorry, I'm flipping it around, but you, you understand what I'm saying here, that even if you have um, a, a higher education, higher degree, um, you still may not live as long as someone who's white who has uh, less education. And so to me, that sort of suggests that um, education is not a, a, a panacea, it's not the be all end all, it's important, um, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't eliminate uh, the inequity that exists in health outcomes. So there's that. The second thing um, that I would say is, is from our own research. So we did a study uh, a few years back where we were interested in a link between racial discrimination experiences and psychological distress. Um, and we were interested in the role that um, gender identity plays and also um, socioeconomic status. And we went in and we thought, okay, we, we expected that the men, these were young adults, um, that the men would have a stronger association between discrimination and um, poor mental health. Um, we also expected that folks who were from lower socioeconomic backgrounds um, also um, would have a stronger association. Um, the findings of the study actually surprised us. The group that was most affected were Black women, so these were all Black uh, young adults, um, from higher SES backgrounds. So the more education um, that their parents uh, had had, uh, and they were women, this was not the same for the men in the study who were from higher SES backgrounds, but there was something about um, the intersection of gender and class that played a role where they had the highest levels of psychological distress and the relationship between discrimination and poor health uh, was, was strongest. And so that really you know, got us thinking about 
No, it's not just an issue of you know, having higher SES. In fact, the unique combination of being a Black woman uh, with higher social or SES attainment introduces an additional burden and additional stressors um, that that um, group has to deal with um, that um, carry an additional burden uh, in terms of these sorts of things. So I think that to me speaks to this issue of does, you know, does class kind of eliminate it? Um, the answer is no. Yeah, yeah. Can I just like to tell on that? Yeah, it's in terms of this whole notion of double and triple jeopardy, you know, even our Latino women, right? Mm -hmm. um, you speak a different language, you know, and so right now we are now uh, addressing what Kimberly Crenshaw, who's a legal scholar in terms of this intersectionality, intersectionality, which bore out of the double um, sexism and racism of which black women experience. And so now we're throwing, you know, all marginalized groups in terms of many um, experiences that they also report, you know, in terms of how, how do we address intersectionality and, and it's um, multiple, you know, I would say um, extension of the spe spectrum that we are including nowadays. So I agree with you totally. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, in this whole like accumulation of racial stress um, that, you know, the whole weathering hypothesis is like so interesting to when you add all of those things together, like you said, intersectionality, it all plays such an important role. And I'm, I'm sure like Enrique, you study mental health, it all plays an important role on all of these things. So the next question is, declaring racism as a public health crisis is a necessary step to ensure greater awareness and allocation of resources. What are some strategies that communities and organizations can implement to reduce the health disparities, but also to um, make sure those resources are allocated for, for this type of study. You wanna start Enrique? Sure, happy to, to do that. Uh, you know, I, I think it's hard um, to say what um, communities should do or or can do. Um, I you know tend to think of the community uh, as as the experts, and they're already doing some of the um, the work in this regard, um, and they know <laughs> probably more so than I do um, in terms of what's important. But um, you know that said, I do think that uh, you know the things that communities are already doing are um, advocating uh, for their citizens, um, trying to get them the resources. Some of the um, partners that we have in Detroit um, during the pandemic were like trying to figure out how do we um, get food um, to um, the folks who need it most? Um, how do we um, advocate for people who don't have internet and who aren't having access to the information about um, how to protect themselves uh, in the context of um, COVID-19? So I think, um, you know, that's one very, you know, sort of um, uh, tangible thing, uh, just the day-to-day the -day things that uh, uh, directors of these organizations are doing. Um, I think um, something we've been trying to be a part of uh, in the work of the Detroit URC is thinking about um, capacity building and uh, making connections between um, organizations. Um, so one of the things that some of our partners have noted is that um, you know people are doing different things in different parts of the city, but in terms of just what are the challenges that we're all facing and kind of having a collective brainstorming around how do we um, you know, deal with those issues? Um, that's one thing that they said you know, would be really helpful. So how can we come together? How can we talk about lessons learned? How can we kind of go through this together? And so I think one thing that um, communities and organizations can be doing is um, you know, uh, sort of linking up with one another um, I think as um, academics, uh, or from where I sit anyway, um, we can be a part of, um, you know, not telling communities what to do or how to do that, but offering to provide resources that would help to, you know, kind of um, build this capacity um, and, um, you know, try to identify opportunities for funding. You know, a lot of the organizations have talked about um, how there's a lot of money that's earmarked for, you know, like this specific thing, um, but it would be helpful to have, you know, kind of unrestricted money um, to be able to do all of the different uh, things that they're be being pulled in all these directions. Can you be a, a community clinic? Can you feed the people who need it? Can you get people on the internet? Um, can you call the, the utility company? So 
Um, I think that um, these are some 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 ways um, that um, communities can move forward and partner with us. So just to dovetail on that, you know, we have the establishment of private and public partnerships, you know, where we are tapping into those who've been in the business for a long time, such as the Kellogg Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and others, and really partnering with um, or, uh, institutions. I would also add that um, when we in engage the community, that they are um, participating at the onset, right? I mean, you have stellar scholars in the School of Public Health who have really um, been trailblazers in this effort, right? So it's not a matter of we are bringing resources to mm -hmm. you and to your point, Enrique, they are scholars within their own right. And so they have a wealth of information which we can learn from them. And we have to make sure that we ensure that they are at the table at the beginning and throughout so that they are not only um, uh, I would say um, uh, providing insight in terms of you know ways in which we can eradicate a given problem or at least um, mitigate a given problem you know but also in terms of seeing it sustained over time let them be the owners of that you know when they feel empowered you're going to see even greater um, returns on your investment versus you know sometimes we have good intentions and they fall short because we have not included the community yeah. It's so important to, to recognize the wisdom in the community and what they know about their own people. I just like to add one other thing about allocations. When you talked about policies, that is very important. And just thinking about how the um, there was this recent study that came out from one of our researchers at the University of Michigan and a variety of other people about how NIH grants are, you know, African Americans are half as likely to be able to get a grant funded than others. So like kind of working at things at the systemic structural kind of policy level um, is important for us to advocate for that as well. So yeah. our next, um, oh, yeah, go ahead. I can jump in. Uh, I, I really like this point and particularly for this audience. Um, I think it's important uh, and it connects back to some of the issues of pipeline um, mm -hmm. that were mentioned earlier. So. Uh, I uh, sit on an NIH study section, uh, and I have recently, people are probably tired of me telling the story, but um, during the um, last term, um, there was uh, a, a grant that received a very poor score, and um, this was a, you know investigator who was well established, so I, I looked over the grant and I was puzzled as to why it received a low score, so I said, let's discuss it, um, and um, the lead reviewer on it, uh, you know, sort of said um, this study has you know it's it's all black people um, there's no comparison or control group um, and so um, i'm not sure this is good science okay we could um, have a long debate about those comments but what was we interesting <laughs> about that is you know this was 2020 um, and um, these sorts of conversations that we might laugh about and think like nobody still says that like they're still happening um, in the places where um, the decisions are being made um, about, um, you know, allocation of funds. Mm -hmm. um, and it's part of the reason why we need more people, you know, to train and bring them. Um, I, I often imagine, as just as I am, like, oh, I don't want to do study sections for another, you know, I'm tired. Um, but I often imagine if, um, you know, we were not um, in the room, um, those grants would not receive the attention, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then the flip side of that is if there's a small percentage of people um, who are stretched between all these things, trying to be everything and everyone, that's the reason we're dying earlier, right? So, uh, I, you know, there's a, uh, it's a complex sort of issue here, but I wanted to raise that in terms of the, the, the um, NIH piece. Yeah, I appreciate you telling that story. None of us had heard it. So, <laughs> and I think it is so helpful to think about those things and why it's so important to have a variety of people at the table, like you were saying as well, um, Shakita. So we have the next question says, COVID-19 made the general public more aware about the healthcare crisis in the United States. Do you think this will lead to reform, actual reform in healthcare? And how can we keep that window of opportunity open? You wanna start, Shakita? I have to remain optimistic. I think, again, um, it has opened the eyes of those who were unaware because it didn't impact them directly. 
Mm -hmm. um, and many people say this has been the perfect storm, you know, the COVID-19 in conjunction with the uh, racial reckoning that has occurred in our country since last spring. Um, and so it has brought to light, you know, uh, many scholars who have been in the field as pertains to social determinants of health and understanding, you know, it's not necessarily in terms of who you are, it's where you are, where you live, and the inaccessibility to health care and, um, and that lacking health insurance and all those factors that have already been discussed. So um, I, I think with the current federal administration who's already created a COVID-19 task force and you have in the lead um, um, Dr. Smith from Yale University who is part of that and it's a quite diverse, robust, you know, um, uh, composition of folks who bring different lens and different expertise. And so that is a huge start. And so, you know, I, I, again, you know, it's requiring, you know, all of those factors. And I remain very hopeful and optimistic that we're moving in that direction. So I would say, yes, I, I see that it is changing its course, but health, I would say, um, uh, teaching hospitals, healthcare organizations, mm -hmm. um, all of which now have, you know, leads who are pursuing um, efforts as pertains to understanding social determinants of health, as well as, you know, I would say, um, really um, looking at ways in which we can change the ways in which we've been teaching our, our future physicians and, and scientists. Thank you. So the next question, Enrique, maybe you can jump in here. It's about mental health awareness and how it be, has become salient during the pandemic. Can you speak a little bit to how racism affects the mental health of people of color, especially among our youth? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I often tell people that uh, if you think of a mental health outcome, um, there's probably a study uh, linking it with racism that shows that, uh, you know, discrimination, uh, racism leads to, to poor health outcomes. Um, so, or poor mental health outcomes. So depression, anxiety, PTSD, you name it, uh, disruptive behavior, there's probably a study um, showing that, that it's problematic. Um, and some studies that we've done with youth, um, you know, they talk about um, feelings of being hurt, um, sadness, they talk about feeling angry, um, but they also talk about, um, you know, um, you know, sort of just, just being tired, psychologically tired. There's this quote I remember um, from uh, a, a photo voice project that we did where the, uh, a young woman said, um, um, being woke is being tired um, and kind of talking about um, just the, the, the psychological vigilance um, that um, is necessary. In studies we've done with younger adults, um, the youth have said, um, you know, um, they feel more like they have to be kind of on edge. Uh, and we actually found in some work at UNC um, that the more people were, you know, sort of saw Black as being a central part of their, their identity, um, you know, they felt more anxiety, distress, um, more depression, et cetera, which is the opposite of what we typically found. And one of the reasons we suspected that was the case was because of the context of UNC. You know, we were having discussions about the Confederate statue. We had the KKK on campus. There were buildings named after, um, you know, KKK, the Grand Wizards, uh, you know. So if I'm in a context where being Black is a part of my uh, central identity, um, and I'm in this thing where I have to kind of be on edge and you know nervous about what's going to happen when I leave my dorm room. Yeah. Um, that's an issue. So I'll say that really quickly. We know that um, I think Dr. Collins made this point earlier. It's not just about individual experiences of discrimination. So all of those social determinants of health that we mentioned, um, those have implications for um, mental health. If I'm, you know, have to stand in a line um, at a food shelter, for example, mm -hmm. um, just about all of the social determinants of health that have been um, studied linked directly to mental health as well. So it's not just the individual instances or microaggressions. Great. So I'll bring in a question from the participants. It says, how do you reconcile interventions that address coping strategies to deal with the effects of racism and the conversation about placing the burden of alleviating health disparities on the individual rather than the problematic system? Just 
Chiquita, do you want to take that? I think it's a combination of the two. I don't think you can put all your uh, uh, eggs in one bucket, as they say, you know, it's going to require both, you know, so we have to do some self-reflection, mm -hmm. you know, and that's where, you know, we really take a hard um, uh, assessment in terms of who you are, right? And um, don't expect to do that on your own. You know, I would say, you know, obviously there are a lot of programs and workshops that are now, you know, coming out of the woodwork, you know, that you can take advantage of, you know. So self-reflection is first and foremost, you know, in terms of awareness is first, and then to do a deeper dive in terms of who you are and how you can change, as well as, you know, having conversations where you can differ in opinion, but you just make, you ensure that you um, respect the other person's, you know, um, uh, convictions and, and narratives. Because again, it's like you have to be authentic, right? And I think we've kind of turned a blind eye and have said, you know, well, that's something of the past. We're no longer a racist society. Well, we never really had those those, uh, as I say, you know, courageous conversations, you know, we've had laws that, uh, that have been passed, but the reality is that we still have not necessarily taken the next step and um, engaging with people who are different from ourselves. And so it's, it's a constant process, you know, so it's not something which you can take one workshop and say, now I'm bona fide certified. You, you have to you have to be invested in it. And I, and I tell, you know, even myself, you know, I look at my inner circle, my network, right? And so I want my children to be exposed to people from all walks of life and to respect what people bring to, um, to um, their lives, you know? And that's how we become, you know, richer in who we are and, and more accepting of those who are uh, different. And, you know, you come to find out that we have more things in common than you would ever believe. You know, I remember when I was in the classroom when I was teaching at UT Austin, for example, one of the prime, um, they had to choose, but they had to do this as a group. They had to subject themselves into an environment which they typically wouldn't, right? And I'm not saying going to a Chinese restaurant, I'm saying where you are the numerical minority and they will come back and say, at first they would have anxiety, right? Because they, they would do it with either another person or with a small group, but they will come back and I would tell you, they would say, oh, you know, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was, you know, in fact, you know, I made a connection, you know, so again, we have to remove ourselves from our comfort zone and take a chance, you know, and that requires courage. That requires that I want to be different. I want to, you know, improve and advance as a society. It takes all of us to do that. And so you look at your neighborhood and nowadays we don't even know who our next door neighbor is. You know, we may say pleasantries, but do we really get to know who people are? Mm -hmm. And um, again, you cannot uh, negate the fact that's how we're gonna move forward. Otherwise, you know, institutions are made of people and people live in terms of where in their respective um, communities, we have to do better because we want better for those who are coming after us. Can I comment on this one briefly? I know we're getting yeah, close to absolutely. that. Mm -hmm. I agree um, wholeheartedly um, with Shakita's points here. I, I think it has to be a both and uh, perspective. Uh, we can't just, you know, put all the eggs in the dismantle uh, white supremacy basket um, and or all the, uh, you know, in coping. Uh, when I write academic papers, there's always a line um, towards the end of the paper that says, even though I'm talking about what we can do now, um, recognize that we need to <laughs> dismantle racism and white supremacy. So um, I think that's important to, to, to bring it, well, bring it home is not the right expression, but um, people are struggling. Um, there is a lot of stress. Um, there's a, you know, David Williams wrote about a, a stress pandemic um, and people need things now, right? So um, people, unfortunately, in, in youth populations, um, some of the ways that people are choosing to cope, and it's not just youth, um, are using substances, um, you know, um, and so if we don't, uh, you know, sort of think about alternatives um, to helping people cope right now with things that have implications for health, um, that's going to be a problem. We can go, you know, protest and, you know, whatever, which is very important. Uh, but we can't just, you know, allow in the, in the meantime people to, you know, um, um, be engaging in these other things that are not health promoting. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for adding that. So um, the last question we'll have is: What curricular changes do you think are needed in health science education? 
um, as we're talking about the pipeline. And what role does critical race theory play in systemic racism and how that's perpetuated in our institutional and social fabrics? So I'll, I'll jump in. So right now across the country, I'm the current chair elect for the Association of American Medical Colleges the Group on uh, Diversity and Inclusion. And we're taking a broad brush in terms of ways in which we can provide guidance um, to our teaching hospitals and medical schools and really doing a deep dive in terms of their medical education curriculum. And that's across the board, not just medical students, also our residents and our fellows, right? Mm -hmm. And we have to also ensure that we teach our clinical faculty who are teaching our students, because we can't just assume they have the wherewithal and the skills and the training to do so. Mm -hmm. And so I always advocate that, you know, medicine, we don't have to do this alone. You know, in fact, given that I'm a social scientist, we can lean on those who have been doing it for many years. Some of us are not um, uh, independent academic health centers. We have, uh, we are under the rubric or the governance of a traditional uh, academic university. And so we have social scientists, we have public health experts we have you know those those that we can tap into so we shouldn't do this in a silo effect we should right. build bridges and, and and tap into partners who can assist us in, in doing that so i would say we're doing a deep dive in our curriculum we're shifting um and understanding historical context because there are some things in which we have kind of perpetuated, you know, in terms of Blacks uh, being treated with more pain, as you had asked, you know, and other things. So we're changing those things. And so um, I'm just happy that, again, you know, we're, we're, we're coming from a global um, perspective and we're providing guidance to those who are in the business in terms of training our next generation of physicians and scientists. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of the curriculum, there's some very um, specific things that can be done um, in terms of um, what's studied, what courses are available, um, you know, who's represented, um, you know, what models are represented uh, in the in, on the syllabi and in the courses and um, in the curriculum that people are studying. Um, in the past year, um, so many physicians um, have, you know, come knocking at the door and say, look, you know, we really don't talk a lot about um, the social determinants of health um, in our training. Can you um, help us think a little bit about this? Or, or can you, um, you know, how, what do we do about this? Um, and in my own experience, I found that um, this is a generalization, but unless um, physicians have had the opportunity to pursue some public health courses or um, you know, have an MPH, their thinking is very different than the folks who um, have not had an opportunity to kind of be exposed to those uh, kinds of courses. So um, I think um, that infusing more of that uh, public health perspectives into the curriculum is important. Um, but I will also say, um, to Chiquita's point, that um, it's important when you think about a problem like racism, um, racism is not just a medical problem. It's not just a public health problem. Um, racism is a problem that involves urban planning, engineering, law, sociology, economics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so um, if we really want to think about the curriculum, we need to train the next generation of students to be able to be adept at, um, you know, sort of um, being able to speak different languages and converse with the people um, who are from different disciplines. To solve a problem like racism, which is so multi-pronged and multi-dimensional, um, it's not going to help if we, you know, it, I, you know, with all due respect, it's important to have medical conversations, it's important to have public health conversations, but there needs to be more cross-fertilization and more mm -hmm. conversations. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, we've got to train our students so that as they become the next leaders, they are adept at um, being able to, you know, um, kind of problem solve um, and build teams that are not just um, unidisciplinary, if that makes sense. Yeah. So as always, the time goes so fast. And so now we're at the hour. Um, I loved how we end on that note, right? So what can we all do, actually? It's not just a, a medical problem or a public health problem. It's a problem across board. What can we all do, and especially as scholars and as trainers, like you were saying, Enrique, of upcoming leaders of all things. So it's just as important for them to have this professional development around diversity, equity, and inclusion, social justice, microaggressions, et cetera, because 
they are going out into the world. So it's just as important as their kind of content expertise. So um, thank you both so much for joining me today. I know you're so busy and I appreciate your wisdom and experience that you share with everyone. I wanna take the opportunity to thank all of the participants on the call for joining us and the leaders um, uh, at Rackham Graduate School, Mike Solomon, who joins every um, month as well. And I wanna encourage everybody to keep in the fight, <laughs> keep everything going, keep the window of opportunity open. Like we said today, we have to have hope and optimism and we all can do something, all of us. If you're coming from a place of privilege, it's sometimes hard to see what's needed and necessary. So keep your eyes, stay in the curiosity and keep moving forward. Thank you so much, everyone. And have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Go blue. Go blue, blue. right? <laughs> All the love. I love it. Take care. Bye -bye. All right. Take care, everyone. Take care, Enrique. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Yeah, likewise. Take care, Shakira.